Hello everyone, we are back and we are going to be talking about how do we distinguish and actually looking at differences in bonding and specifically in intramolecular bonding, which again, those three types that we're going to be talking about in this class are covalent, metallic, and ionic. And how do we distinguish uh, between those types of bonding based on electronegativity? So the key thing that we, uh, again, valence electrons are kind of what, what help to determine those differences and specifically whether those valence electrons are gained, lost, or shared. Um, so um, we'll come back to intramolecular interactions, but for the intramolecular interactions, if I am dealing with a metal, so if I'm dealing with like titanium bonding to titanium or iron bonding to iron um, or copper bonding to copper, if I'm dealing with a metal bonding with another metal, what type of bonding do you think we have? Yep, yeah, that's right. It is metallic bonding. Excellent. <laughs> very, very, very good job. So um, that's quite um, straightforward. And the way that those, when you're dealing with a metal, the way that the valence electrons are distributed is you have basically these positive cores of, you know, your nucleus and your metal, um, basically atoms. And the valence electrons are what we refer to as delocalized. So instead of being localized to an orbital, they're free to kind of just run around through this kind of, uh, you know, sea of these kind of positive ion cores. So this kind of makes sense in terms of like why we think, uh, obviously conductivity, especially electro, electro conductivity base are, is, depends on the ability of electrons to kind of move through materials. So when we have metallic bonding, you have this kind of sea of delocalized electrons running through and around these, um, surrounding these kind of positive ion cores. So in metallic bonding, those valence electrons are completely delocalized. So um, they can, you know, basically they're running around everywhere. Now the question is covalent versus ionic. How do we determine when do we have covalent bonding? When do we have ionic bonding? And the key metric that we're going to define and use in this class is electronegativity is going to tell us that difference. In covalent bonding, those valence electrons are going to be shared between essentially those orbitals. In ionic bonding, one, again, our cation is going to lose valence electrons, our anion is going to gain um, electrons. But how do we determine, and again, so clearly that means that in ionic bonding, Electronegativity is basically how attracted or how how much does that material want to hold on to electrons. So, if there's a big difference, one you know one material is going to grab and steal all those electrons. One material is going to give away all those electrons. In covalent bonding, electronegativities must be somewhat similar because they're sharing essentially those valence electrons. They're they're not again being kind of extremely localized to one side or another. So, in this course. The real answer is there's no kind of universally defined difference in electronegativity that distinguishes between the two. And to be honest, we really never have 100% covalent or 100% ionic. Instead, we're going to have, most of the time, something that's partially covalent, partially ionic, which we kind of call some type of polar covalent, some, you know, kind of the Goldilocks, you know, middle ground um, regime. So that's typically what we are going to experience. But let's go ahead and let's look at um, some examples. So if I'm looking at covalent CC, right, or if I have CH3, you know, H, 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 and, you know, H, H, H. If I look at this bond, that's for sure going to be covalent, right? Because I know that carbon and carbon have the same electronegativity. Um, Let's look at some other examples. So how about we look at MgCl2. So magnesium and chlorine. So let's go ahead and look at our periodic table. And if we look at our handy dandy periodic table, especially this page, we can see that electronegativity is given by kind of this second one up from our shells. So if I look at magnesium, and again, second column, right? So I have two valence electrons, one valence electrons. That is 1.31. So Mg has 1.31. And I'm going to go ahead and define that right now in Mathematica. Mg equals 
And then CL, I believe, is equal to 3.16. Let's see if uh, my memory is as good as I claim. Chlorine, 3.16. We can see right there. I still, I still got it. Um, excellent. So um, let's see. What is that difference? CL minus MG, 1.85. So that is quite a large electronegativity difference. Um, so if we look back at our metrics, I believe anything greater than 1.7, we are going to call that purely ionic bonding. Um, yes. So that is true. That is the case there. Um, what about, how about Al2O3? Let's look at aluminum and oxygen. So let's go, let's get our periodic table. Oxygen is like 3.44, very electronegative. O equals 3.44. Uh, let's look at aluminum is 1.61. And I believe that we're gonna have uh, O minus AL. Uh, and that's another, again, ionic bond. Um, and again, we can go through and you can kind of see some examples and um, where something may be polar um, or not. Uh, and then we can kind of uh, look at those um, to kind of see where we're at. Actually, you can do P. Let's see if uh, P is 2.9, 2.9. How about CL minus P? So that's pretty similar. So if I look at P, CL, 3, that may be something that's polar covalent. Again, it's not purely you know, covalent, but um, I think you get the picture now. So we can distinguish between those two, those types of bonding. Now, we haven't talked about van der Waals. Van der Waals interactions are again, in this whole class of intermolecular interactions. And when we talk about intermolecular, I'm talking about, you know, these are like, van der Waals interactions exist everywhere. So if, even if I have like my CH3, H3, there's going to be fluctuations, really quantum mechanical fluctuations, your electron cloud that create these kind of like spontaneous dipole, fluctuating and spontaneous like dipole moments. So that is a type of intermolecular interaction that kind of always exists. I could also have, what type of bonding is this? It's the key to life. H2O, hydrogen bonds. Um, even more important is this kind of amide structure. If you see this, this is present a lot in, pro in every single amino acid and protein. This can cause hydrogen bonding essentially between our systems here. So this is very, 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 very critical. So hydrogen bonds are also a type of intermolecular interaction. Additionally, if you have kind of structures like this, next, you know, a C double bond to an O, um, if you see fluorine, if you see oxygen, these, if you have, you know, for example, another molecule next to it, like H, it is going to lead, well, that's a bad example because it's, um, <laughs> but uh, anyways, even if you have an H next to here, it's gonna want to steal, like O is gonna grab electrons from here. And again, it could cause these kind of like dipole moments. So negative charge here, positive charge here, that's gonna create a dipole. So F, N, Cl, very O, Anytime you see these types of molecules, that can create dipole moments um, or polar interactions, intermolecular interactions. Now, the key thing to note about all intermolecular interactions, you see here, we have energies. Now, what is KT? So KT, K is your Boltzmann's constant. So K is equal to 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. It's also equal to 8.617 times 10 to the minus five EV per K. If I multiply Boltzmann times whatever my temperature, let's say it's room temperature 298K, you see I'm gonna get units of joules, energy. So KT is a unit of energy. So we express a lot of things in terms of KT because it gives you kind of a sense. So if I look at room temperature fluctuations, it's saying that to break a single covalent bond, I'm gonna need at least 200 times the thermal energy available in this room. So is that bond gonna be able to break and reform? 
Not likely. If we, if we have 200 times temperature fluctuations, you know, although with the way that our climate is now, uh, uh, maybe it could, be, <laughs> it's not, maybe it's not too far away. But anyways, um, discussion for another day. That's not going to break. Same thing with ionic, metallic. These intramolecular bonds are not going to spontaneously break and reform at room temperature. But look at van der Waals. Those interactions do spontaneously break and reform. And this actually should make sense. When you have proteins that are folding and unfolding and rearranging and performing these kind of um, basically restructuring at nanosecond timescales, they need to be able to break and reform extremely quickly um, with the thermal energy that's present essentially in the environment. So uh, these intra intermolecular interactions are always less than one KT in general speaking, we can kind of lump them together and they will spontaneously break and reform at room temperature. And that what's, uh, that's what allows all the cool soft matter behavior that um, we see exist. So uh, key things, intramolecular interactions for met metallic, completely delocalized electrons, ionic, covalent. Ionic is shared or given away um, and covalent is, or no, excuse me, ionic is either taken or given away. Uh, covalent is shared, and both of those are localized electrons. And then intramolecular interactions happen all the time, especially for polymeric materials. So this is and what we've been drawing here. And if this continues, this is a polymer that is polyethylene. It's your trash bags. So in this polymer, we have obviously covalent bonds, but there's also going to be van der Waals between here. Um, and there are more complex... Um, interaction so we can actually draw polystyrene and we'll come back to this or even PVC so polystyrene looks like this and it just repeats so these big bulky molecules where these are basically this represents um, uh, a styrene which is you have double bonded carbon along these at each of these points to hydrogens these are big bulky bonds those are steric interactions those are another type of intramolecular interaction as well um, i could also draw pvc polyvinyl chloride the white all it is is this change but this change here is significant because again you introduce those dipole and polar interactions so that is kind of bonding in a nutshell and next time we are going to get into a very, very interesting and very sad story, but a very important lesson that we need to learn, um, the isomeric states of materials. So we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.